Thunderfoot's video. Yay! Anyway, um, using a flip minnow this time. Um, a three F three sixty. Yeah, F three sixty. Um, looks something like this, except it's black on both sides. This is, you can get them customized, you know, from flip and whatever. And blah blah blah. But anyway, um, internal battery really bad. Um. <laughs> You know, with the battery, you can't really replace it easily. So when the battery goes dead, the camera is useless. So it's kind of silly. Anyway, not that it's useless, but yeah, you're going to have to, you know, pay somebody who knows what they're doing and do surgery on it. Anyway, um, yeah, Thunderfoot. Yeah, we'll do more camera stuff later, possibly, maybe, but I don't know. I'm tired. <laughs> Too tired to do camera. Uh, anyway, here we go. Loading. My wireless signal is low. Uh. Let's talk about chemical evolution. In laboratory science, it is proven that hydrogen cannot turn into another element. So, we already know that chemical evolution is impossible. Actually, the sun is powered by hydrogen being converted. Oh, gee, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, no. Ooh. Yeah, this, this video is uh, devoted to beryllium. Okay, yeah, I forgot to do my little um, element stuff. I had to actually look it up. Cause I, couldn't, I, I said beryllium. What is that, like radioactive or something. Anyway, four electrons. Um, it's kind of like um, atomic aluminum. It's almost how I describe it. I mean, it's sort of like aluminum in a lot of ways, except it's toxic and, you know, very reactive. So, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, really, it's very conductive. It's very strong, rigid, um, you know, but very light. So, you know, you can imagine it would have applications in, like, airplane skins and stuff if it wasn't hard to work with and poisonous to humans. Um, yeah, so I guess they, you know, so they use it in, like, aerospace. They use it in the military, uses most of it. And, um, you know, um, it's transparent to, like, gamma rays and x-rays and that kind of stuff. Well, I guess everything's transparent to gamma rays. But anyway, um, so they use it for windows and stupid silly little things um but anyway lenses and things uh so it's sort of you know it's i wouldn't call it transparent but um so apparently like the electrons are very far away from the nucleus you know that kind of thing so stuff can go through it easy i think that's kind of how it works um yeah so i just you know so they use it in alloys so you know they mix it with something else like copper and it makes the copper stronger um more brittle, but stronger. Uh, yeah. So that's really the problem with it. It's too brittle, and it's hard to work with. So it's, it's you know, it's cheaper to make tungsten, which is still hard to do, but um, it's easier than messing with beryllium. So anyway, all right, now we can go back to this. It's into higher elements by a process called fusion. It's the energy released from this fusion that heats and lights the Earth. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so he's just basically explained to him that evolution of em elements does take place, um, you know, but it takes place in suns and, you know, some stuff. I think beryllium is actually one of the ones that isn't created in a, in a, in a you know, through suns. You know, it's kind of a big bang element or something. I mean, it's a really special circumstance that creates beryllium. So it isn't manufactured by supernovas. So, I don't know how many elements fit in that category, but there's not a whole lot of them. However, the creationist may well argue that no one has actually ever been to the sun. Ah! I'm burning to death! Oh, you know how much it apart... So he steals cartoons to make his argument, too. I, I always found that a little bit of lame, too. It's like, you know, somebody will steal, <laughs> you know, South Park or whatever. And, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean... This stuff is only good because, you know, that's produced content, and so you really should do it on your own. What would that big would cost on the sun? So let's discount the sun for the moment. Here on Earth, there are numerous groups working on laser fusion where hydrogen is converted into higher elements. Then, of course, there's the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, currently being built in France, which is designed to harness the energy released from the fusion of hydrogen into helium. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look good to me. Ooh, no, that is bad. Spooky, spooky. I ain't going to France. 
However, even if a creationist were to ignore all of these examples by which hydrogen is converted into higher elements, there are more graphic examples of fusion. Oh, yeah, well, look, there's all kinds of this stuff going on, especially with those wacky elements. They're always turning into something else. I mean, you blow one of them up and you get, like, five carbons and three hydrogens and six something else is left over. So, I mean, obviously, elements are made out of elements, essentially. Oh, ding, 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 ding. Now you're going to... It is proven that hydrogen cannot turn into another element. Hydrogen cannot turn into another element. All right, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Which we've proven to be impossible. I, like, again, I think it was, you might have been saying impossible, except if you blow everything to pieces. Here's a fun fact. Because the moon can eclipse the sun so perfectly, we can measure the constituency of the sun, the materials and elements on its surface, by observing the pinkish arc of the chromosphere at the moment of totality. Is oh, isn't that cute? He was all talking science-y. Oh, yeah, that was really sweet, Venom. Um, that's funny, you know. Uh, that's that's just funny, you know. Like he actually read a science book. Uh, fun. Fun fact. The only reason we cannot observe the elements on the surface of the sun all the time is because we live under an atmosphere. Without this, you could make exactly the same observations you can during an eclipse simply by putting your finger over the body of the sun. Here's a fun fact. If we could actually see in the H alpha wavelength, we would be able to directly observe the dynamic behavior of the surface of the sun. Uh, yeah, if we had like a filtering controls and like a telescope that popped out of our eye and yeah, yeah, right, and some radiation filters. Yeah, we could do all that. It'd be really cool. Except who the fuck cares? Yeah, not really interesting, I say. I really don't give a rat's butt what's on the surface of the sun. I don't care if it's covered with rat's butt. I really don't care. Here's a fun fact. Have you ever wondered why there isn't an eclipse every time the moon orbits the Earth? No, 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 no. I never wondered. Never, never, never. It has something to do with its uh, arc of delineation or something, correct? <laughs> it's simple. The angle between the plane in which the moon orbits the Earth to the plane in which the Earth orbits the Sun is about 5 degrees. Practically, this means that a total solar eclipse can only happen at two times of the year. Well, guess what? I guess we, we already knew that, I guess. We we knew it wasn't happening every day. Yep. And we knew even when it happened, we didn't give a... Who cared? Who really cared? Except for, like, the cardboard companies, because they made them little cardboardy things to look at it with. Uh, in a different geometrical arrangement, such as, say, for instance, the moons of Jupiter, an yeah. eclipse is observed every time the moon goes around the planet. The moon fits over the sun so perfectly that it makes it possible to observe the surface of the sun. Otherwise, this would be impossible. If the moon was too big or too small, it would be impossible. Because of our vantage point from the Earth, the moon fits perfectly over the sun, the chances of which are one in a trillion. Wow. One what a crock of shit. <laughs> yeah. The distance between the Earth and the moon varies by about 10%, between about 360 and 410 million meters. This practically means that the angular size of the moon can vary by about 10%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just basically saying there's a, there's a large margin for error in terms of distance to get that eclipsey thing happen. But it would be kind of neat, though, you know, if the moon was a little bit bigger, and then you could get, like, an eclipse where it really wiped the sun out. I mean, just wiped it the hell out, pitch blacky kind of thing. As a direct result of this, about 60% of non-partial eclipses, the moon is too small to completely cover the sun, and an annular eclipse is... Oh. All right. um, interruption. Yep. <laughs> so I'll be an edited video after all. Uh, I have to go replace a thermal couple in the furnace. So that's a good physics and chemistry thing. It's actually two pieces of metal, you know, fused together. And uh, <coughs> when you heat it, it creates a little electric current. Because apparently the metals don't like being forced into proximity. Um, and so they expel, <laughs> you know, in, in protest, especially when they get hot. Ah, go the doors open. Oh, it 
it's gonna be nasty, nasty, nasty down here. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, I have to go to work. So I'll catch you later and such. All right, I'm back in the house. Anyway, back to the video here. Yeah. So this is gonna be edited. So forget the camera stuff on this one. Observed. In the remaining 40%, the moon is too large, and a total solar eclipse is observed. Yeah, right, very All boring. that is required to observe the outer layers of the sun is for the moon to be angularly bigger than the sun. Yes. Further, it's completely bogus to call this perfect, for the simple reason the moon does not have a smooth surface. Oh, well, This whatever. causes an effect known as Bailey's Beads, where the sun shines through the valleys of the surface of the moon. Cool. Oh, uh... Well, I'm not oh, going to sit here and tell you that I know how the planet was formed, because I don't. The Bible says God made the heavens and the earth in six days. Is that the same Bible that allows you to make the statement that... The moon fits perfectly over the sun, the chances of which are one in a trillion. <laughs> yeah, one in a trillion's pretty funny. Uh, I don't think so. This is the thing I'm always curious about when creationists assess probabilities. In order to make a statement on the probability of the moon perfectly covering the sun, ignoring for the moment the fact that it doesn't. Yeah, but what about when, um, you know, scientists, you know, do that uh, Drake equation thing? Aren't they pulling little numbers out of their ass, too? Just like these numbers? Yeah. You would need to have a solid understanding of the mechanisms and the dynamics of the formation of the solar system and the planets. And yet... Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know how the stars or the planet was formed, because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, whatever. This is kind of, you know, same old, same old for a short video. Meanwhile, I appreciate you guys cannot understand the Big Bang. It must be... Clearly, this is pure imagination, yet it's in a science textbook. Ridiculous, right? So, if there is pure imagination sneaking into the textbooks, how can you trust what it says? Let's keep going. The conservation of angular momentum, we're going to talk about it, shows that if some... What, you mean the conservation of angular momentum that's in all the textbooks, which only moments ago you described as containing complete imagination? And as I don't think so. No, you're just talking about the Big Bang stuff. It, you know, some of that is kind of just made up. Whatever. It's ridiculous. The moon fits over the sun so perfectly that it makes it possible to observe the surface of the sun. In laboratory science, it is proven that hydrogen cannot turn into another element. So, we already know that chemical evolution is impossible. Uh, well, whatever. I mean, that one just seems so... I don't even know why creation would bother with that one. I mean, we have enough elements to make lots and lots of compounds, so, yeah, we really don't need to turn one element into another. And the chances of which are one in a trillion. Oh, that was dumb. Mm, well, anyway. Okay, that was boring. Wow. Yeah, that one we didn't... nothing there to do anything with at all. So, I guess I'll just, uh, fast motion my... <laughs> whatever furnace crap in the background, and we'll just call this one a day. God, I'm really tired now, though. I hate having to be interrupted and go to work. Fuck. Jeez. Oh, anyway, um, yeah, I don't think anything else is news. I'm so tired. Oh, see, I fell asleep. I gotta turn the camera off. Alright, I'm back. Um, yeah, a little bit more, maybe. Uh, I should put the camera somewhere. Yeah, I'll just put it over here. I don't have to hold it. Good. Um, excellent. Fantastic. Superb. Um, anyway, some more video, I think. Um, yeah, I have notes from videos I watched. Um, some guy, and then some guy did some kind of puffer fish video or something, called me a puffer fish or something. Uh, I thought that was kind of bogus. Um, it's that guy I hate anyway. It's Ed A. A. D. Johnson or something. I think that's something like that anyway. Fucking asshole. It's always 
posting snarky shit comments. Anyway, oh yeah, the battery thing too. You know those big batteries. Big, you know, I put them in my little nine LED light, and uh, it's really, really bright now. Yay! Uh, the switch didn't work worth shit anyway on that thing. It's a little too big the battery, so I just put foil at the end. <laughs> yeah, but it works. So yeah, yeah, it's good. A uh, big snow coming, so I have to get myself ready. Um, didn't fix my backup thing yet, though. My battery thing still beeps. Got to fix that. Damn it. Um, so what else? Um, yeah, I'm really not in the mood for snow. All right. So anyway, so this guy was uh, ragging the pufferfish video about uh, the objective morality thing again, and this just—it isn't that complicated. Um, so anyway, he says, um, is quoting him, only his own preference that suffering be minimized. So, um, he's basically just saying that somehow that's a personal preference, that I personally decided, you know, or, or subjectively, I have some subjective interest in concluding that animals suffer and I can't eat them anymore. Like, I didn't have any subjective personal incentive to draw that conclusion. The conclusion came from other information. Nothing subjectively motivated me in that direction whatsoever. So that would tend to towards an objective observation, one that's not based on a personal bias or personal desire or personal preference. There was no personal preference in drawing the conclusion that I'm not allowed to do that, just as it wouldn't be to my personal preference to conclude it's not a good thing to rape or do other things. I mean, there's no personal interest in drawing that conclusion. Uh, because I'm not going to be a victim, likely. Um, so why wouldn't I say, yes, it's, I'm all for it? Well, I wouldn't do that because it's not logical. And you're just not, you're not accepting the fact that there's this other part of our brain that analyzes and can think. And you put in some basic information and it draws conclusions that are totally independent of the selfish asshole who has an incentive. So again, it's just these words, objective and subjective, that get so ruined, um, because, uh, you know, it it's depends on how you, if you're thinking of uh, objective like some sort of object, and so it can't be subjective because it's an object <laughs> or something, uh, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to break the idea, but if you think of objective as being separate from a personal interest, a, a narrow interest, and something that is done from some point of view uh, away from the maze game, overlooking the maze and analyzing the maze. We can do that with our brain. That's this great imagination thing. We can model things. We can run them. We can make it go through its um, paces in our brain and see how it comes out. So anyway, it's just stupid to think that somebody has a personal incentive to conclude that suffering sucks. I mean, there is, there's no personal incentive. It is exactly the opposite personal incentive. Um, all right. Uh, so anyway, um, so then he said something about hypocrisy or some other kind of bullshit. And uh, what did I write here? I can't read my own writing. Preferenarian hypocrisy. Preferenarian. I don't know. Um, so you have self-desire and then ethical understanding. There you go. They're not the same thing. Right? A, a self-interest, a personal desire, is not the same thing as some sort of ethical understanding. Some understanding is based on you've acquired some knowledge. Okay, I feel. Feelings have this fundamental good-bad thing. Um, there's some states of feeling that are just horrific, and then there's other states of feeling that are spectacularly cool. Um, and that's, you know, it's not really subject to debate, and you want to call that subjective, I think that would be silly. Um, but the point is, is from my personal experience, I've learned that. And I'm not, it's not some crazy logical leap to assume the same kind of activity is happening in all those other brains out there that are genetically related to me, that they function essentially the same way. Um, and that they have the same kind of motivating mechanisms and sensations. And, um... Yeah, then you just do the logic. You know, then you just do the, you know, uh, how's it turn out? I mean, how's the, when you throw the, the crap together, how much friction is there? 
it's like uh, let's say you had crops, you know, and you, you had wheat and you had corn and you had rice and you had all these different crops. Now you could you could say, well, which one tastes the best? And you could analyze it that way, and that would be sort of pointless as an experiment. Um, or you could analyze them in some objective manner by an objective standard and say, which one performs the best? Basically, which one capitalizes on solar energy to the greatest efficiency and takes as little resource out of the soil as possible? That would be the efficiency standard because you don't want to have to, you know, burn a bunch of oil to create fertilizer to, to, to put energy into the soil so the plant can steal it from the soil. You want something that basically grows on the sun and um, doesn't require any other energy input. Um, so yeah, so then it's just an equation. Then then you go out and you look. Well, how many calories do you get out of it? Uh, how much <coughs> does it? Uh, you know, how much of its life cycle is dependent on stealing um, energy from the soil, and how much of it is dependent on the solar energy? And you can make an evaluation and draw a conclusion. I don't know the facts there, but you know it'd be worth knowing, right? Which one's more efficient? Um, and uh, that has to do with our behavior in life. Is these are efficiency equations, and that's this essentially morality. So I don't like the word morality. I didn't invent it. It's part of the culture. Um, but you should be able to understand that when I'm communicating about morality, I'm communicating about an ethical equation, a value equation. And it's premised on something you know, that defines the value. So if you're going to argue with it, I don't think you can argue with the logic. You have to argue with the premise. Um, and I don't think you can do that rationally. Do you have an alternative theory of value? Do you have some explanation of how um, our sensations are complete lies and um, actually suffering is excellent and fantastic from some sort of other perspective? It could be viewed that way. Um, is it is it is it possible to convert it into a, a positive thing? I don't think you have a theory that could make that make sense, and I don't think you have something that's even close to a theory that would make sense. So if there isn't a competing theory that has any glimmer of rationality or reasonableness, um, then yeah, you have to go with what's right in front of you, Occam's razor kind of thing. Um, Experiments can be judged by the net product. Yeah, well, basically that's it. And they said something about some kind of authority. Well, the authority is in the judgment, is in the logic, and the credibility of the logic. And, uh, like I said, I don't think you can undo the premise. So, undo the premise that suffering does in fact suck, that it's the price we pay for life. Um... And then all we're really arguing about is what is uh, an acceptable price to pay. So some people will pay $25 for a Twinkie, and other people will say, I ain't paying 25 bucks for a Twinkie. That's goddamn insane. Um, yeah, and so that then it becomes subjective. But the fact that there is an item for sale, and we are paying for it, is a fact. Uh, and then the next stage is to argue about what price is worth what goody. Um, yeah, so enough of that. Uh, the other guy, I don't know if I need to go on his stuff. I'll save those for later, maybe sometime, like a year from now, I'll do his video. I already did part of it. No, I'm just tired. And uh, I wanted to bend this towards Thunderfoot, but again, it's, you know, uh, it didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's one of these people who thinks... Um, life is a bargain, you know, that somehow we're making a profit on it, the deal, um, that all the suffering that's gone into its creation is something to admire and get all gooey about, and, you know, we can look at the pretty colors and say, oh, isn't that neato, oh, look at that, the moon did this, ooh, 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 um, and somehow that's worth the price that we've paid for this capacity to do that, a capacity completely built out of, you know, billions of years of carnage to acquire these, the, the, this perception, the capacity to be as fucktarded as some asshole who will, you know, climb on top of Mount Everest with a pair of binoculars so he can get the clearest view possible of, uh, you know, a rock in space. 
Uh, sorry. No sale. Yeah, that's the, the end game. It's no friggin' sale. You're buying dog shit, people. And uh, you can keep dressing it up and keep putting it in fancy packaging. You know, you'll say something like Honeywell on it. It'll, it'll be all bright colors and orangey writing and stuff. But no, it's dog shit, people. You're buying dog shit. No, it's not dog shit. It's just shit. You're buying shit. Uh, <laughs> life is shit. It's not well manufactured. It's worse than 1954 Chinese telephone or Japanese telephone. Yeah, it's worse than that. It's like, you know, it's the the plastic will stick to your fingers. It's so bad. Um. Anyway, <sighs> yeah, that's enough. Um. Yeah. So sorry. This is a really fucked up video. I'm having a fucked up day. <laughs> I know. My brain's not right. Uh, God, I'm so, I'm so not in a very good place. Um, 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 um. Oh, I got better. That fixed everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm just all oh, relieved now. No stress at all. Tomorrow is not even going to be here, so I don't even have to worry about it. <sighs> Alright, anyway. So, till the next time and such. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, I got some beryllium in my brain. I got a lump on my head. <laughs> it's not a good thing, lumps. <sighs> but anyway, what are you going to do? Whoa, hit the button. I hate this damn camera. Uh, well, anyway, no, you didn't need to see that crap. Anyway.